morning, everyone. We want to welcome you this morning to our morning worship hour here at Mountain View Baptist Church and our live stream. We're so thankful you're with us this morning. We appreciate you tuning in. And uh, we're going to open in a word of prayer. We'll ask the Lord's blessing upon our service together. Let's pray and ask God's blessing. Father, we just uh, want to thank you this morning for the beautiful day outside. Lord, we're just so grateful for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. Lord, we do pray that you would just uh, be with us in a special way today. I pray that you would uh, visit each of us in our homes and uh, might your presence be sensed and known. And uh, I pray that, uh, Lord, that the, the singing and the music, uh, that it will uh, minister to us and uh, also that the word of God will minister to our hearts and meet needs today. Lord, we're a needy people and we, uh, we look to you, we turn to you in this time and uh, we ask that you would just work in our hearts Lord, I do pray if there's someone listening in today, Lord, that uh, doesn't know if heaven is their home, that today a relationship with Jesus Christ would be born, and uh, Lord, that they would come to you today to be saved. We'll thank you for all that you'll do. We love you so much, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we're going to start off with some singing, and it's a song called, It's Just Like His Great Love. It's just like his great love. We'll sing it together. A friend I have called Jesus. A friend I have called Jesus, whose love is strong and true. And never fails, our end is tried, no matter what I do. I've sinned against this love of his, but when like Jesus to grow the clouds away. It's just like Jesus to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great love. Sometimes the clouds of trouble beat in the sky above. I cannot see my Savior's face. to roll the clouds away it's just like Jesus to keep me day by day it's just like Jesus all along the way it's just like his great let's sing it on that last verse oh I could sing forever of Jesus love divine of all his care and tender for this poor life of mine his love is in and over all and wind and waves obey when jesus whispers peace be still and rolls the clouds away it's just like jesus to roll the clouds away it's just like Jesus to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great love. Amen. Good singing this morning. I hope you're singing and joining with us. And um, But I'm so thankful uh, that he, our Lord, has the power to roll those clouds away. Uh, boy, it just seems like we're in a cloudy time, doesn't it? But uh, I'm so thankful uh, that he is in control. It's just like his great love, and uh, we praise the Lord. Thank you once again for tuning in. I just want to give you a few announcements this morning. Uh, we are praying for our uh, missionaries of the week. Uh, keep all of our missionaries in prayer. Uh, but uh, this week we're highlighting the Big E ministry. As many of you know, we have a, a Big, e, Big E ministry. That's the the fair that comes uh, up in September through October. 
And uh, we have a booth set up there. It's a gospel preaching booth. And we just uh, were there to uh, hand out tracts and, and smile. And uh, we want to be a blessing to folks. Uh, but that's a great ministry. We look forward to this year how God is going to use that ministry once again. But do pray for that and uh, ask the Lord to bless. Also, we're praying for the Savini family. And uh, these are our church planners uh, right out uh, here from Mount View Baptist Church. We're praying for them as they're planning a church in Cape Cod. Uh, do pray for them. They're uh, looking forward to getting in their building. They have a new building. They're, uh, they're looking forward to meeting there. Uh, but uh, like us, they're doing live stream and uh, doing the best they can right now. But uh, we're real excited how the gospel is going to uh, be preached. And, um, and we're looking forward to what God is going to do there on the, on the Cape. So do pray for the Savini family. Uh, all right, just a, a couple of things uh, uh, I want to mention. I want to mention also happy birthday I know it's Sister Jean Law's birthday, and uh, Sister Jean, we want to wish you happy birthday this morning. I don't know of any others, but if you're celebrating a birthday, uh, we want to just take a moment to say happy birthday. Or if you're celebrating a wedding anniversary, we want to say happy anniversary. I know we have uh, uh, one coming up for next week, uh, but we'll talk about that then. Uh, by way of prayer, there are many that are in need of our prayer, and uh, church, don't forget Wednesday night we are uh, lifting many of these requests up in prayer. Uh, I want to encourage you, if you do have a prayer request, please uh, put it there on our Mountain View uh, Facebook page, and we'll make sure we pray for those things uh, this coming Wednesday. But we've uh, heard of several this week that are in need of our prayers. Uh, our missionary, the, the Childer family, uh, pray for Barbara Childers. Her mom uh, went home to be with the Lord. So uh, do pray, lift up Sister Barbara Childers in prayer. And also, uh, we're praying for the Mickey family. Um, Wendy, Mickey, her mom, Evelyn Phoenix, uh, went home to be with the Lord. Uh, Evelyn, well, Henry and Evelyn, they were uh, members here, actually both born right here in Holyoke. They were members here at Mountain View Baptist Church for many years. Uh, I can't do much out here w as far as landscaping without thinking about Henry. Henry Phoenix, for many years, took care of all of the, the property here and uh, did many of the planting, uh, but these were precious folks, and uh, Evelyn joins with her husband uh, there in heaven. So uh, do pray for Wendy, and I know they have other children. Uh, do pray for their family, and let's lift them up uh, to the Lord and ask God to give them strength and peace in this time. And then we also learned uh, this past Friday that uh, Sister Elizabeth Peterson, her dad, uh, Ray, passed away. And, uh, and so we want to lift up the, the Peterson family as well as her family, her mom, uh, her sister and brother. And uh, let's ask God just to comfort this family in this time. We know that God, he is the God of all comfort. And, uh, but it is very difficult. I know when we have uh, loved ones that are passing away, and especially in this time where we can't really uh, be together. And, and uh, so it's tough. So let's pray and lift up these families and ask God to, to meet them. Uh, where they are, and give them strength and peace in this time. All right. Well, that's all the announcements I have, so I'm going to ask Pastor Miller to come at this time. He has a few announcements. Well, we've been keeping in touch with our teens and doing a Zoom meetings. We had one on Wednesday night. It was just great. We had a good group of teens, and we just had Sunday school this morning at 10. And I'm impressed with being in a... In a um, different schedule. Most of the teens were there and they were involved. So it's, it's good to see their faces and good to, to have that involvement. So we'll continue with that. If you do have teenagers and they're not a part of our group, please let me know. We'd love to join them in with our, our Zoom meetings. And if you don't know what Zoom is, it's that video app and we're able to all be involved and a part of the um, the lesson. So it's been really good and we'll look forward to Wednesday night. Um, tomorrow night, there's a teen girl Bible study. So for all the girls, my wife will be holding a Bible study for all the teen girls at 630 and um, she will have some special things for them, and she's really excited to be able to, to spend some time with the girls, so girls, make sure you plan for that. And then, guys, uh, we have a church, um, a men's Bible study that we're going to do on Zoom this Saturday. We've never, I've only done this with the teenagers before, but we're going to try it with the guys. Um, I won't be able to make you coffee or do some of the things we normally do, but I think it'll be really good to get all the guys together and just to get around God's Word. Um, so we're going to do Saturday at 10 a.m., 
and I will send out, I'll create a Zoom meeting, and I will send out all the information. Um, I'll try to get it to as many people as I can, um, but if you want to be a part of it and you don't get an invite from me, make sure you let me know um, by Saturday, and we'll make sure you, you get a part. If you have a computer or your phone, you can be a part of that. But guys, we'll be a men's Bible study Saturday morning at 10, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing each other then. All right, just want to give you a, a quick update on the property, things that are going on with the building. And uh, this week we had the plumber here and the air condition, and they're uh, going to be uh, doing some, some of that work uh, coming this week. So we're real, real excited. If you don't know, if you haven't been up here lately, uh, the roof is on, uh, the building is watertight. So uh, we're so thankful for uh, that continuing, and we look forward to being able to use it. And I'm looking forward to you getting all of us being able to get back here in this building. Uh, we these chairs are just sitting waiting for you, these nice, comfortable chairs. And uh, but we uh, we're just asking the Lord just to help us to be patient and wait this thing out. Of course, we want to do all we can uh, to keep folks safe and abide by these restrictions. Um, and uh, we'll pray for our country. I know uh, the president had talked about May 1st, uh, trying to get back, trying to slowly open things up but let's just pray uh, for wisdom uh, for our leaders and uh, those uh, our governor and all those who are uh, leading us and uh, doing their best to keep everyone safe so let's pray for wisdom and direction there uh, but it is a beautiful a beautiful day out today beautiful spring day yesterday snowed can you believe it uh, boy oh, here in new england if you don't like the weather just wait a while it's going to change, but today is absolutely beautiful. It's wonderful to see all these these uh, trees that are blooming, flowers are coming up. Uh, just a beautiful, beautiful sight out here at, in the property, and we're so thankful uh, for this time of year. And um, we look forward uh, to getting back. So uh, let's just uh, keep one another in prayer, and uh, don't forget, uh, share this live stream. Uh, invite others to join in as we worship the Lord together this morning. We're going to sing out. Uh, again, and uh, it's a song that is uh, called I Know Who Holds Tomorrow. And aren't you thankful that God knows about tomorrow? He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. We can trust Him with our tomorrow. Let's sing it together on the first. I don't know about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from His sunshine. For its skies may turn to gray. I don't worry o'er oh, the future, for I know what Jesus said. And today I'll walk beside him, for he knows what is ahead. Many things about tomorrow I don't see understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. Every step is getting brighter as the golden stairs I climb. Every burden's getting lighter, every cloud is silver the sun is always shining, there no tear will dim the eyes. At the ending of the rainbow, where the mountains touch the skies, many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand. But I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. I don't know about tomorrow. It may bring me poverty, but the one who feeds a sparrow is the one who stands by me. And the path that be my portion may be through the flame or flood, but his presence.
ferns goes before me, and I'm covered with his blood. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my All right, folks, uh, we, we're having a little technical difficulty where, there with the special uh, music, so we'll, uh, we'll come around if uh, we can get that working. Uh, but I do want to just, once again, take a moment to thank you for joining in today, and uh, I know many in need of our prayers, so uh, let's uh, keep one another in prayer as God's people. I wanted to mention also uh, Joyce Barron. Let's pray for her. Uh, she's had a tough week, tough, uh, uh, actually, few weeks. Um, and uh, there's been many needs there, but do pray for that situation, and let's ask the Lord just to help uh, people that we know about and uh, meet them where they are. All right, well, this morning, uh, we are going to turn to God's Word, and I'm going to ask you to join me in the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth, and, uh, and I put it out there as you uh, saw the title uh, here this morning, we're going to be... Uh, considering the first chapter of Ruth this morning, and I've entitled this morning's message, The Unseen Hand. Uh, and, uh, and of course, this is speaking of God's unseen hand in our lives. And uh, Ruth is a wonderful picture of God uh, working behind the scenes, his unseen hand. So if you're there with me in Ruth chapter 1, we're going to do some reading. We're going to read through the first chapter. So if you just follow along there in your Bible, and we'll begin Ruth chapter 1 in verse 1. The Bible says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Bethlehem Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the name of his two sons Malon and Chilion, uh, Ephratites of Bethlehem, Judah, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left in her two sons. And they took them wives of the woman of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died, also both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. 
And then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore, she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. And then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would you tarry for them till they were grown? Would you stay for them, uh, stay them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. So for the next few moments, church, I'd like to preach this message entitled The Unseen Hand. But before we go any further, let's pray, and we'll ask God's blessing upon his word to our hearts this morning. Father, once again, we're grateful to be together worshiping you. Lord, we're so thankful for how you're working in our lives uh, even this morning. Lord, from this story, I pray that we would learn some valuable lessons about how you work, even in the midst of, of despair and in our trouble, that God, you are present, and God, you are working your plan. Lord, I pray that each of us that are tuning in this morning would recognize God at work in our own lives, what he's doing in our families, in our situations, and Lord, that we will see you in your plan for our lives as individuals. God, we do pray that you would just uh, bless your word. I pray that our hearts would be uh, just tuned into you. Help us uh, to just remove any distractions or anything that would keep us from, from hearing your voice this morning in our lives. We'll thank you for what you'll do. We'll praise you. We'll give you all the glory, and it's in Jesus' sweet name we do pray. Amen. You know, many people don't know this about me, but uh, I have traveled the world over. Uh, I've made journeys to most, the most wonderful places in all the world. Uh, places like the Taj Mahal in India, uh, been to the Kremlin in Moscow. I've even been to the Colosseum in Rome, been to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. And I've even visited some of the most obscure places. I'm talking back streets in, in, in most countries around the world. And you might be asking, Pastor, when did you do all this? How did you do all this? Well, I was able to visit these wonderful places through the help of none other, none other than Google Earth. 
with just a few clicks, I can virtually touch down almost anywhere in the world. Now, I have to be honest, when I first discovered Google Earth, for many nights, I'd lay in bed and travel the world. Uh, my wife sometimes uh, would turn over and say, are you leaving again? Uh, because I spent a lot of time just visiting places. I, I just think it's amazing. You can pretty much touch down uh, anywhere. But, you know, if you've ever used Google Earth, and I imagine some of you that are listening have used Google Earth, you know how it starts off. It starts off with a global view. And if you, and it's almost as if you're looking from space. You see the, the entire Earth. But then you can begin to zoom in on a location. And of course, you can turn, turn the world wherever you want. You can uh, pick a place. You can begin to zoom in. And the closer you begin to zoom in, the contour of, 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 of the earth and of the land appears. And, and then you can see in more detail the lines that are dividing countries. A little further in, you can zoom a little further in, then you begin to see states and cities, and you can zoom in even a little further, and then streets, and then homes, and then you can click, and this is what I love, you click the little guy there, and it's street view. I mean, you can get down on the ground and begin to travel. I think that's just amazing, truly amazing. And folks, I think that's what the book of Ruth is like. It's like God is zooming in and touching down to a small town called Bethlehem, Judah. But then he zooms in even further, and he zooms into a specific family. And he gives us details about this family situation. Now, I believe he's doing this to reveal to us his providential plan in the lives of ordinary people. But through these ordinary people, God will bring about extraordinary events. Now, when we read through this chapter, I want us to see a few things this morning. And I pray this will be, uh, this will be a help to you. That first of all, I want us to see that in our lives, that God is at work in the dark times. God is at work in the dark times. Look again, if you would, please, in verse 1. The Bible says, now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. Now, that's important for us to know. Because the days when the judges ruled, if you don't know what that was like, well, you can just back up one verse. And uh, it would be Judges chapter 21 and verse 25. Just back up one verse. Uh, it says in verse 25 of Judges 21, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now you can only imagine when a man is his own law, he has no authority and no order in society. It was chaotic. It was a time of great spiritual darkness. I mean, there were periods during this time where there was tranquility when judges ruled, but uh, but, but when judges were not in place, there was chaos. And, um, and so the book of Judges, it sketches one of the darkest spiritual times in Israel's history. Joshua, if you remember Joshua, the successor to Moses, he led Israel out of the wilderness and into the promised land. Under his leadership, Israel had conquered much of the land which God had promised to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses. But after uh, after Joshua's death, we read this, and I'm just going to kind of back up to, to give you a background here of the time when this was written and to see that God works in the dark times. In Judges chapter 2, verses 10 through 13, it says, And also that generation were gathered unto their, for, unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods uh, of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. 
And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. Now listen, these verses, and you can read that in Judges chapter 2, 10 through 13, again, just giving us a description of the spiritually dark time in the nation of Israel, God's covenant people, his chosen people. The reason why God chose them is that they were to be uh, a picture uh, to all the world of, of who God is. And they were to make known uh, the God of, of the world to the nations around them. But they served other gods. They worshipped false gods, Balaam and Ashtaroth, the Bible says. And so these verses describe the bleak condition of Israel. Now, we may look at our world today, our nation, and even our community. Uh, I think we could come to the conclusion that we are indefinitely, spiritually, dark times. We see what's going on in our nation. And perhaps, you, maybe even personally, you're going through a dark time. You know, you can know that through the dark times, even though uh, things get, they grow bleak and they grow dark, in the world around us and even in our own lives, we can know that God is at work, even if you don't see the immediate evidence of it. I know that I've heard, listen, I've heard some troubling things going on in our country uh, among Christians and how, you know, uh, oftentimes there's attacks upon our faith and our beliefs. And we see these things, things that we believe we'd never see here in America are taking place uh, in our day and age. Now, listen. Uh, we can grow fearful and panic about those things. But, friend, I want you to know that, listen, no matter how dark it grows, that God is at work, uh, no matter what's going on. He's at work. Hudson Taylor, uh, the pioneer missionary to China, said this, God uses men who are weak and feeble enough to lean on him. Now, friend, listen, that's how God works in spiritually dark times. God's people, listen, we need to lean and trust in God through the dark times of life. Think of a dark time in your life when you later realized that God was at work. Well, I can point to many uh, times in my own life, and I imagine you can as well. Think to a time when you were going through a valley, and then on the other side, coming out of that valley, you look back and you see, now I see what God was doing. And so, friend, listen, we can take courage uh, this morning that God is at work in our lives no matter how dark it becomes. The second thing I want us to see this morning is that God is at work through our desperation and despair. Now, let's look at this family here. Verse 2, it says, In the name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife Naomi, and the name of his uh, sons, two sons, Malon and Chilion, Ephratites of Bethlehem, Judah, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. Now, why did they go to Moab? Well, verse 1 tells us there was a famine. Now, uh, that famine, uh, it may have been that the Lord had sent it. Uh, in fact, uh, he had told Israel, his people, listen, if you serve other gods, if, and we know he brought them into the land of Canaan, he warned them. Uh, not to uh, serve and not to worship their gods. Uh, but yet we see over and over, time and time again, uh, they worshiped other gods. They forsook the Lord. And God had warned them, listen, if you do these things, that there will be judgment. And uh, it's, I believe that this famine was, was brought of the Lord uh, to teach his, his people. And uh, it tells us again, going back to what we read in Judges chapter 2, it said that they were serving Balaam and Ashtaroth. Balaam, uh, and if you know anything about these, these false, you know, these, these uh, mythical gods, but uh, Balaam was the god of, uh, he had the idea of provision and fertility. And especially when Ashtaroth was brought in, to, to worship as well, because Ashtaroth uh, was the female counterpart uh, uh, for Balaam. And so, you know, they had this, this false idea in view that when, you know, there was a sexual union between Balaam and Ashtaroth, that that would bring fertility or that would, you know, their land would become fertile. And they began to, you know, worship these gods that 
uh, were not providing for them. They, they weren't the ones that were caring for Israel. God was. And so they forsook God. And, and so there's a famine now. But we see here this family is moving out. They're moving away from Bethlehem, Judah, which I think is kind of ironic because Bethlehem means house of bread. And they are leaving the house of bread because there is no bread. But this family is moving because of desperation. There's no food. And um, we uh, see this family go, go now about to go through a time of great despair when they move to this land of Moab. Now, some have uh, questioned Elimelech's decision to leave Bethlehem. You know, was it the right decision? Was it the wrong decision? And I've heard both sides. And uh, I would say, well, it would depend. It would depend if he was uh, following, uh, being led of the Lord, then certainly it would be the right decision. But many might say, well, look what happened. You know, look what happened to his family. He led them from Bethlehem. They went to Moab. And what we read here is that, you know, Limelech died. And then a little bit later, the two sons died. And, and, and you would say, well, that was a terrible decision. It was a dumb decision for Limelech to ever lead his family out of Bethlehem. But can I say, if that decision had not been made, even though it did bring heartbreak, then we would not have a book of Ruth. <laughs> uh, I think that this is an, a perfect example, and, and there are other, others in the Bible, but this is a perfect example of how God works through the free will of man. In other words, the free will of man is meeting the sovereignty of God. Uh, now, I know this is a subject that's been debated for centuries, and I don't believe that this sermon is going to put an end to centuries of debate, but... We indeed see a free will decision that Elimelech made. But we also see God working in the details to bring about his purpose. I personally believe, that as believers, God never intended us to be bogged down to debate uh, this idea of the free will of man and the sovereignty of God. That's not something that I believe God ever intended for us to debate. I believe that's something God intended for us to enjoy and to rest in. That even through our decisions that God is working behind the scenes through his providential care and wisdom and love for mankind. You see, there's no decision that you or I make, uh, no circumstance, no event that is ever outside of God's sovereignty. And yet God himself does not violate our free will. But he works indirectly through our decisions to bring about his purpose. And yes, there are times when God does work directly. I mean, that's what I believe many of the miracles that have happened in the Bible is God directly intervening in the affairs of men to bring about his purpose. And so we see God's providential care, uh, even though they made what you might or I might consider a bad decision to leave Bethlehem. God says, well, I have a plan and I'm going to work my plan. You see, there's two sides to the same coin. But this family here goes through a great time of despair. Looking again in verse 3, we see first Elimelech dies. Now Naomi is left a widow. But I imagine at least there's hope in her heart that she still has two sons. And now each of them uh, find wives there in Moab. They marry and so I imagine in Naomi's heart, there's still the prospect of grandchildren. You know, children will come along. And, and so there's still some hope there. But then we read in verse 5, look in verse 5, it says, Now her two sons, Malon and Chilion, both of them die. And now she's left there alone. Well, she has her daughter-in-laws, but no doubt a great time of despair and desperation in this family. And folks, can I say in the darkest of hours, we already looked at that God works through the darkest of times, but God is at work through our own personal desperation and despair. Again, God zooming into this family and he knows what they're going through. He knows their suffering and their loss. And friend, God knows about your loss as well. He knows what you're going through. He knows your heartbreak. 
And friend, don't despair to the point where you give up on God because God is working through. God has a plan, and we need to learn to trust him through those times of desperation and despair. We see uh, a little bit of hope here. Uh, now she's a widow. She's childless. She has her daughter-in-laws. But notice, if you would, in verse 6, she gets a little glimmer of hope. It says, then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited his people and given them bread. Now, the Bible doesn't say where this news came from. We don't know how she heard. But this news caused her to make a decision to return back home. I imagine uh, that decision also was uh, based upon her family, her people being there. And maybe now that she's uh, uh, fatherless, and of course, for, for a woman in this time in the Bible to be uh, without a husband and without sons was a very difficult position for a woman. And she would have to fall upon the mercy of her family and the community. And so that's what I believe she's doing here. She, she hopes for the mercy of her people to care for her. And so she begins to return back home. But as she returns, she finds that her daughters-in-law are with her. They, they, their plan is to return with her. And so uh, this leads me to, uh, well, uh, this leads me to my last point. And, and I just want us to think about this last point because it's very Im important. And that is God is at work through our decision, decisions, our determination, and our devotion. Now, let me read through a few verses here. When Naomi is about to return back home, again, wanting to uh, go back home, perhaps falling upon the mercy of her own people, but notice as she begins to return. Look, if you would, please, in verse 7. It says, Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return into the land of Judah. Naomi said unto her daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. So we can kind of see Naomi here, uh, you know, her... Her sadness through her sadness, she doesn't want her daughter-in-law to follow her. You know, she probably feels bankrupt in her life that she has nothing else to give, nothing else to offer them. And, and she does pray for them. She prays that God would bless them once again with, with, with husband and children. Look, if you would, please, in verse 9, the Lord grant you that you find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. So she's praying that they'll find another husband. And then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee in thy people. Boy, we see their determination and their devotion, both of these daughter-in-laws, towards their mother-in-law. And listen, I know there are a lot of mother-in-law jokes out there, and, and people, you know, we have a, a certain view of, of mother-in-laws, but, uh, boy, this is, this is a, a, a great picture uh, how they viewed their mother-in-law. They viewed her as mom, and they, they wanted to comfort her. They wanted to be with her and, and care for her in her time of desperation and despair. But verse 10 says, And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And verse 11 says, And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb and they that they may be your husbands? So she's telling them, Listen, I, I have nothing else to give. I can't. I can't give you husbands, you know. She says, turn, verse 12, turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would you tarry for them till they were grown? Would you stay for them while uh, from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. So we kind of get a, a look into how Naomi is feeling. She's feeling alone. She's feeling hopeless. She feels she has nothing left to give. And she feels that perhaps this is the way life is going to be from now on. And she's coming to grips with the bleak future that's before her. But notice, if you would, in verse 14. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. And that 
meant that she returned. Orpah returned back to her own home there in Moab. But notice the last part of verse 14. It says, but Ruth clave unto her. It means she wouldn't leave her. Verse 15, and she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people, unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Go away, Ruth. But notice verse 16. Notice her decision, her determination, and her devotion. Verse 16, and Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God, my God. You see, the decision that Ruth is making here is that she was going to go with her mother-in-law and that she was uh, determining or, or making a decision to not only be with her as her daughter-in-law, not only in this family relationship, but also in her spiritual relationship with God. She says, your God or thy God will be my God. Verse 17, where thou diest, I will die. So she knows she's going to Bethlehem. And, and so she's not only, uh, you know, de de determining and being devoted to uh, Naomi, but she's being devoted to her God and being devoted to her people, her land. She goes on to say there, the Lord do so to me. And more also, if aught but death part thee and me. So here's a determined young lady says, I'm not going to leave you. Look at verse 18 says, Naomi, when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, she left speaking to her. In other words, she allowed it to happen. She realized she's not going to change her mind. And so she allowed Ruth to return with her. Now, this is interesting. And uh, we read in verse 19, so they two went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And this tells me that, that Naomi, Elimelech and Naomi and this family was a well-known family in that community. Uh, they had left out of desperation. But yet here Naomi is returning without her husband, without her sons. And so no doubt this news moved the city. I imagine they were grieved for her. They, they hurt for her. They tried to encourage her. Look at verse 20. And they said unto him, uh, I'm sorry, verse uh, 19 again. The whole city was moved about them. And they said, is this Naomi? But notice what Naomi says, verse 20. She said unto them, call me not Naomi. Call me Mara. You see, Naomi, that name, that name means pleasantness. But she says, call me Mara. Mara means bitterness. She says, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. You see, she could only see her darkness and her despair. That's all that was before. Could we blame her? I certainly can't. I mean, here's a woman who's been through a lot. She's pretty much lost everything. She doesn't know the future. She has Ruth with her, but I don't even think she understands what that means. Look at verse 21. She says, I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Well, that's not entirely true, is it? Because Ruth was there. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? Can I just pause right here? I think there are a lot of people that feel this way. They feel that God has dealt very bitterly with them. They feel that God has dealt them a bad hand in life. And, uh, and you may have that view of your own life. Things that have happened, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. Again, darkness, desperation, despair. These things are part of our lives. And oftentimes what we do is we point the finger at God. And we say, God, you're doing this to me. God, if you really cared. God, if you really loved me, you wouldn't allow this to happen. Now, friend, just wait a minute. Just wait a minute. Before we begin pointing our fingers at God, let's realize the meaning of this story, why this story is in the Bible. This story does not end with this situation. Look in verse 22. Say, so Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem. Now, this is very important. 
in the beginning of barley harvest. Now, I love how that chapter ends. It says it was the beginning of the barley harvest, which I want you to take time to read through the rest of the story this week. Would you do that? It only takes about 15 minutes to read through the whole book, 85 verses. But take some time because this barley harvest, God was doing something here that was extraordinary. They couldn't see it. They couldn't understand. All they saw was their loss. Uh, all they saw was their pain. But it says it was the beginning. And friend, listen, it was a beginning. It was a new beginning of God beginning to weave situations together for his glorious plan. You go on to read this story, and I'm not going to give you all the spoilers, but, 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 but we find that God uh, uses Ruth. He uses Ruth, this, this wonderful woman, that she was a Moabitess, but, but God uh, used her to meet a man, uh, a, a kinsman, who would become not only a kinsman, but a kinsman redeemer. And uh, we would find that through this relationship that was born here in, in this story would eventually uh, continue a line that would bring about our Savior. You go over to Matthew in chapter 1. You open a, uh, the, uh, the first chapter and you read that genealogy. There are three women that are mentioned in that uh, gene genealogy. There's Tamar. And Tamar, if you know, uh, she had stains in her life. She had, she had a lot of things in darkness and despair in her life. Uh, another lady that was mentioned was Rahab. Rahab, you know, was the harlot, the one who hid the spies. And so there were stains upon her life. And then we find the last one who was mentioned in the genealogy of Christ was Ruth, a Moabitess, Moab. These people, by the way, were not friends of Israel. These people were the enemies. These were people that were from Israel. We know it, it, they, they, they go all the way back to Lot. And it was an uh, incestuous relationship there that, that when Moab was born. But even through all of that, we see the hand of God. You say, Pastor, what does all this mean for us this morning? What are we to take away from this? Is that God's working behind the scenes today. God's working through times of darkness and despair, globally, nationally, individually. God is zooming in this morning. He knows your situation. Take comfort. Though all you may see is darkness and despair, listen, God's going to work through our desperation and despair. But listen, I love Ruth's decision. She said, I'm going to follow God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cling to you, and I'm going to be... Uh, your people, I'm going to be among your people and become, uh, you know, uh, a, a person who is, uh, will, will be a, a citizen and one who will worship God. You see her de decision and determination. God used that. And listen, God will use our situations and our decisions in our devotion to him. You know, the best decisions I have made in my life have been when I have set out to follow God and obey God. Those decisions have brought great blessings in my life. I know this. I missed a lot of pain from doing things my way. I missed a lot of suffering that I would bring about through my own decisions, doing things my way. And listen, I'm just here to say God will bless your decision of devotion to him. And if you get determined to follow God, I'm not saying it's, a, it's always an easy path, but I will say this. God will bless and God will work through that decision. He will bring about things in your life you could have never imagined. He will bring about things in your life, and he will use you in ways that you would never believe he could use you. Just as he did with Ruth. He used her decision there to bring about the Savior later on. Ruth is the, the grandmother of uh, none other than King David. And you follow that line, and you see... Uh, there, how God used Ruth in her decision to, to follow God. Can I say this? God will use your decision today to follow him. But I want you to be encouraged that no matter what's going on in your life, no matter how dark things, listen, in, in some of that darkness may, may have been uh, brought upon by bad decisions. 
Elimelech made a decision that ended up, you know, he died, his two sons, and it was a terrible time. But God worked through, through that, through his providential care and love for his people. And listen, that hasn't changed. Our God is still the same today. He said, I am the Lord, I change not. Listen, God, God is working today in your life. I want to encourage you to ask him to help you to see what he's doing today. When's the last time you prayed that prayer? God, help me to see what you're doing in my life. Help me to see what you're doing today. And, uh, and I believe we'll begin to see how God is weaving together a plan for our lives. God holds our story. He does. He, he holds it very tightly. He has a plan for every one of us. Sometimes we want to hold tightly to our story. We want to make the decisions. Can I tell you, every time I've held tight to my story and have insisted on, on my way, boy, I really get in a mess. <laughs> but when I see, when I've opened up my hands and said, God, I want you to hold my story, those are the, and really all I have to do is wait on him. And, and really that's what we have to learn to do as God's people is just wait on the Lord, wait for him to move, wait for him to direct. We can trust him with our story. Now I want to encourage you to do that today. The unseen hand that's working in your life. Do you see it today? Is God revealing that in some way, some small way, what he's doing in your life through a situation? Let's pray and we'll ask the Lord's blessing upon his word to our hearts. Father, once again, we're just so grateful for this time together. I pray, Lord, that we would see the unseen hand working in our lives today. Help us to know that you have a great plan that you are working even through and weaving through the darkness and despair, even through bad decisions. Lord, we know that our free will will never be outside of your sovereign will. God, that you can even work through the bad decisions we've made. Lord, I may be talking to some this morning that maybe are in a harvest of their bad decisions. I look at their life and they wish things could have been done differently. Wish things could have been turned out differently. Help us to realize it's never too late. But Lord, even today you're working in our lives. Help us to trust you and see the unseen hand. I pray if there's someone listening in today that doesn't have a relationship with you, they might know about you, they might know a lot about you, but God, they don't know you personally. Help them to see that you are a personal God. I pray that they would invite you into their life this morning. They would open their heart, confess their need for you, and trust you as their Savior. We'll thank you for all that you do. Lord, We I want to pray once again, just bless those that are hurting today. So many going through a dark time, a dark period in their life. And I pray that you would comfort them we know you are the God of all comfort. And Lord, just as you brought comfort, we see a little bit later in chapter 2 of that story of Naomi blessing the Lord, praising you, because she's got a glimmer and a glimpse of hope in her life. I pray that we would also sense that by your presence today. We'll thank you for what you'll do. We love you so much. We pray all this in Jesus' sweet name. Amen. Church, once again, I want to thank you for tuning in this morning. Uh, join us back this evening, 6 p.m. Uh, tonight we have uh, Pastor Aaron Booth who's going to be bringing a message, and uh, we'll look forward to that. Uh, but until then, the Lord loves you, I love you, and you're dismissed.